I'm writing you from somewhere in France, hoping this finds you well. Sergeant says I'm doing fine, a soldier and a harp. Here's a song that we will all sing. It'll make you laugh. We're gonna hang out the washing of the deep sea line, and you will see dirty washing of the deep. We're gonna hang out the washing of the deep sea line. All right, well, thank you for joining another episode of Traveling Through History. Really glad you're here with us this week. And this week we tackle a very interesting topic from World War II. And we actually previewed a little bit of this episode coming when we did our D-Day episode, which was a couple weeks back. And if you haven't taken a look at that D-Day episode, we put a lot of research into that. We've had a lot of fantastic feedback. Uh, so check that one out when you get a chance. But uh, today we're going to be talking about the Battle of Dunkirk. And uh, Dunkirk is also sometimes referred to as the evacuation of Dunkirk, because it's essentially what happened over the course of nine days from May 26th to June 4th was the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force, or the BEF. And this was a group of elite soldiers who were all volunteers. They were not conscripted or drafted into the British Army like many of the other troops were in other arenas around the world. These were there because they wanted to be there. Uh, they had been in the military for a long, long, long time. They had fought many different battles and they had uh, proven themselves as elite fighters and uh, very well-trained fighters. So that's why they were there. And they were in France um, helping the French, helping the allies in general, trying to defend France and Holland and Belgium. Uh, this was basically the opening salvo of the war. This was in May of 1940. Uh, really early on in the war, uh, America, of course, had not joined the war yet and several other of the allied uh, countries like Canada and others had not joined yet. Um, so very early in the war, uh, France had not fallen to Germany yet, uh, similar to the way it did in World War I. So what Germany did during this uh, battle for France early in May of 1940 was they did a uh, incredible maneuver through the mountainous regions in Western France and um, essentially went through passes that the French and, and British felt were impassable. They took their tanks, they took their trucks through the Ardennes area of France. And uh, so France and England had not fortified that area because they figured that the Germans couldn't get through those passes. They had been impassable in World War I and they figured that was the case in World War II. Instead, the Germans had figured out a way to get through those passes with all of their vehicles. So in a very sneaky way, in two and a half days, they worked their way through those passes into France at a location that was completely unexpected, and then uh, started working westward from there. Uh, and you, you can imagine uh, coming through in a blitzkrieg fashion how surprised the British and the French were that this action occurred. So essentially, the uh, Brits and French had stationed themselves in Belgium and Holland to try to defend and were in the wrong locations. And so they got outflanked. And you ended up having several hundred thousand Brits uh, flee to Dunkirk, which was one of the major ports in France. Of course, in our D-Day uh, episode, we talked about Calais, which is where the Germans thought the D-Day invasion was going to take place. But uh, instead, Dunkirk, being one of the smaller ports in France, was where the Brits took off to during this action because they had been outflanked. They got to Dunkirk before the Germans uh, by about two and a half days and entrenched themselves and built a perimeter of about 25 miles around Dunkirk, which stretched across uh, northern France and into Belgium. So it actually stretched across two different countries. The Germans then, of course, came upon uh, this entrenchment, and there was uh, essentially trench battles back and forth for a while, while the British were trying to figure out how they were going to evacuate their men off of the beaches of Dunkirk. Uh, and so it was a really desperate situation. The Brits knew that if they didn't get these 300,000 plus men off the beaches and back home, uh, they wouldn't be able to fight for another day. And if it had been the slaughter that it potentially could have been, uh, it could have been really a huge blow to the Allies and to their ability to wage war against the Germans at that time. Again, the Americans had not joined the war yet, and uh, so the European powers were trying to make a go of it themselves. So... Um, some of the military leaders at that time for the Brits actually stated, and, and we'll talk about this later in the program, that it would be an absolute miracle if we were able to get these men off the beaches, but they were sure we're going to try. And uh, a call went out during this process to 
not just Royal Navy ships, but any ship or any boat that was available from private citizens. And if you saw the movie Dunkirk that came out uh, some years back, it's an excellent movie, by the way, by Christopher Nolan. Um, it shows in intimate detail uh, how elaborate this operation was that the British uh, people put in by giving their boats up to the Royal Navy, in some cases actually captaining those ships over from England to uh, Dunkirk, France, and to the surrounding areas to pick up servicemen and take them back across the channel to England to safety. And uh, this was an incredible, incredible feat that they pulled off in those nine days. Uh, and as it's often referred to as the miracle of Dunkirk, the fact that they essentially saved the British Army. They also, by the way, saved about 140,000 additional troops who were French, Dutch, and other allies at the time. Um, so. This was a humongous operation, the largest evacuation in world military history. Uh, still unbelievably, uh, still studied incredibly, still studied today in military colleges and military strategy uh, discussions about how in the world they pulled this off. And so today we're going to talk about the Battle of Dunkirk, about the evacuation, a little bit about uh, the Battle of France, how France fell only 30 days later after Dunkirk. And so you can see um, that although they did pull these men off the beaches and back to England for, to fight for a future day, it was still a disastrous loss for the Allies. Uh, essentially, France had fallen. Most of Western Europe had fallen. And uh, Germany now controlled essentially about 85% of Europe. And so uh, it was a disastrous day. But the good news was that they had pulled their men back and that they could fight another day with the Allies and come up with a new strategy. Of course, we know that that strategy was several years later when they attacked on June 6, 1944 at D-Day and were able to liberate France and then eventually liberate all of Europe. So let's go ahead and talk about some details about the Battle of Dunkirk. The Battle of Dunkirk was fought around the French port of Dunkirk during the Second World War between the Allies and Nazi Germany. As the Allies were losing the Battle of France on the Western Front, the Battle of Dunkirk was the defense and evacuation of British and other Allied troops to Britain from May 26 to June 4, 1940. After the phony war, the Battle of France began in earnest on May 10th of 1940. To the east, the German Army Group B invaded the Netherlands and advanced westward. In response, the Supreme Allied Commander, French General Maurice Gamelin, initiated Plan D and British and French troops entered Belgium to engage the Germans in the Netherlands. French planning for war relied on the Maginot Line fortifications along the German-French border, protecting the region of Lorraine. But the line did not cover the Belgian border. German forces had already crossed most of Netherlands before the French forces had even arrived. Gamelin instead committed his forces under his command, three mechanized forces, the French first, and the Seventh Armies and the British Expeditionary Force, or the BEF, to the River Dial. On May 14th, the German Army Group A burst through the Ardennes area, which was the heavy, heavily forested area that we talked about earlier, and advanced rapidly westward towards Sedan, turning northward to the English Channel using Monstein's plan, which was essentially Blitz, Blitzkrieg under the German strategy and flanked the Allied forces. A series of Allied counterattacks occurred, including the Battle of Arras, failed to sever the German spearhead, which reached the coast on 20th of May, 1940, separating the BEF near Armentons and the French First Army and the Belgian Army. So what the German pincer attack, or what their Blitzkrieg had done, is it essentially had split the British BEF, the French First Army, and the Belgian Army into three parts which was a brilliant strategy by the Germans. Further to the north, the majority of French troops uh, south of the German penetration were waiting. After reaching the channel, the German forces swung north along the coast, threatening to capture the ports and trap the British and French forces. In one of the most debated decisions of the war, the Germans halted their advance on Dunkirk in what became known as the Halt Order by Adolf Hitler. And this suggested the German forces around Dunkirk pocket should cease their advance on the port and consolidate to avoid an Allied breakout. 
Hitler sanctioned the order on May 24th with the support of the German high command. The army was to halt for three days, which gave the Allies sufficient time to organize the Dunkirk evacuation and build a defensive line. With more than 330,000 Allied troops to be rescued, the British and French sustained heavy casualties and were forced to abandon nearly all of their equipment. Around 16,000 French and 1,000 British soldiers died during the evacuation. The British Expeditionary Force, or the BEF, alone lost some 68,000 soldiers during the French campaign total. So you can see this French uh, campaign and the battle for France, there was heavy losses by both the British and the French during the, all these different skirmishes and battles leading up to the evacuation at Dunkirk. In terms of the halt order, uh, Hitler had visited General von Ronstadt's headquarters. The terrain around Dunkirk was thought unsuitable for armor. So von Ronstadt advised him the infantry should attack the British forces at Arras, where the British had provided capable, significant action. Hitler, who was familiar with Flanders' marshes from the First World War, agreed this order allow the Germans to consolidate their gains and prepare for southward events against the remaining French forces. In addition, it was found out later that Hitler also did not want to make some of the same mistakes that were made in the First World War, one of them being never giving the German troops any chance to rest. So the three-day halt was also based on trying to uh, let his troops rest up because they had been in battle after battle after battle up to that point. The uh, true reason for the, his decision to halt the German advance is still debated. Uh, there's lots of theories, and we talked about a couple already. Uh, one is that Hitler was also trying to establish diplomatic peace with Britain before the operation got larger. And so uh, whether it was to let his troops rest or whether it was because he felt like he had the Brits trapped against the coast or whether it's because he wanted to give time for diplomacy all these reasons could have been part of his thinking. But obviously, uh, looking back later at this uh, strategy, it was the wrong strategy for the Germans. They essentially allowed the British and the Allies to get off the hook. We could have squashed them against the beach. In terms of the defense of the perimeter around Dunkirk, while they were still moving into position, they ran headlong into German 256 Panzer Division, who were trying to outflank Gort Armored cars of the 12th Loyal Lancers stopped the Germans at Newport itself. A confused battle raged all along the perimeter throughout May 28th. The command and control of the British side disintegrated and the perimeter was driven slowly inwards towards Dunkirk. So you can see what was happening these days that the men were being evacuated off the beaches was the British and the French were desperately trying to hold this perimeter that had been established around Dunkirk this 25 mile perimeter so that they could build this space center, this cocoon into the battle overall to allow as many of the men as possible to get on boats and, and go home. So this was uh, their attempt to really slow the Germans down. The Germans were attacking and attacking on a daily basis. In addition, not just tank battles were um, flaring up all over the place. And so of course, tanks were a big part of World War II, but um, there was air battles happening. Uh, the Germans were attacking with dive bombers. They were attacking with large bombers. Um, the British Royal Air Force was coming in in support, and there was lots of battles that were happening mid-air between airplanes. And uh, it was a, just a really confused situation. A lot of the men on the ground couldn't figure out who was which in terms of what plane was bombing them, what plane was bombing the other side. So uh, really it's an interesting and confused situation that was happening. So in terms of the retreat to Dunkirk, on May 31st, General von Kutschler assumed command of all the German forces at Dunkirk. So this was a couple of days later. His plan was a simple all-out attack across the whole front on June 1st. Strangely, von Kutschler ignored a radio intercept telling him British were abandoning the eastern end of the line to fall back to Dunkirk. During the night of May 31st into June 1st, Marcus Irvine Andrews won Victoria Cross in the battle when he defended 1,000 yards of territory. So this was a real big deal that he had won the Victoria Cross because of this defense that he did against the Germans. So uh, June 1st was clear and good flying weather in contrast to the bad weather that had hindered the operations on the 30th and 31st of May. 
Although Churchill had promised the French that the British would cover their escape, on the ground it was the British and the French who held the line, while the last remaining British and French soldiers were being evacuated on the beaches. Enduring concentrated German artillery fire and Luftwaffe strafing and bombs coming from their um, airplanes, the outnumbered French and British stood their ground. On June 2nd, the French began to fall back slowly, and by June 3rd, the Germans were about two miles from Dunkirk. The night of June 3rd was the last night of evacuations. At 10.20 on June 4th, the Germans hoisted the swastika over the docks from which so many British and French troops had escaped. And I will talk a little bit later about the th th over 300,000 troops that were saved in those eight days, but pretty incredible that uh, they barely made it off those docks. And then eventually on June 4th, as you saw, the Germans got to Dunkirk and uh, arrested a bunch of the people that were left behind, including lots of medics and people taking care of wounded. In terms of the evacuation itself, the War Office made the decision to evacuate British forces on May 25th. And in the nine days from May 27th to June 4th, 338,226 men escaped, including 139,000 French, Polish, and Belgian troops, together with a small number of Dutch soldiers aboard 861 vessels. Pretty incredible if you think about, and if you've seen the movie Dunkirk, um, the vision of all those vessels coming across the channel at the same time to come rescue these men. It really was an incredible scene. Many of them being strafed by German planes and being uh, shot at and artillery from the beaches shooting at them as well. It was really a, quite a treacherous uh, engagement that they were doing here. The docks at Dunkirk were so badly damaged they could really not be used, but the east and west moles, which were seawalls protecting the harbor entrance, were intact. Captain William Tennant, in charge of the evacuation, decided to use the beaches and the east mole to land ships. This highly successful idea hugely increased the number of troops that could be embarked each day. May 31st, about 68,000 men were embarked that day. The last of the British Army left on June 3rd. Tenet signaled Ramsey to say operation completed, returning to Dover. Churchill insisted on going back for the French and the Royal Navy returned on June 4th to rescue as many as possible of the French rear guard. Over 26,000 French soldiers were evacuated on that last day, but between 30 and 40,000 more were left behind and captured by the Germans. Around 16,000 French soldiers and 1,000 British soldiers died during the evacuation. 90% of Dunkirk was destroyed during the battle. You can imagine after these nine days of battling back and forth and trying to extract these men, what Dunkirk must have looked like with the tanks firing and the artillery firing and all the small arms. It must have just been an unbelievable scene afterwards. Following the events of Dunkirk, the German forces regrouped before commencing Operation Fall Rot a renewed assault southward, starting on June 5th. Although the French soldiers who had been evacuated at Dunkirk returned to France a few hours later to stop the German advance, and two fresh British divisions had begun moving to France in an attempt to form a second BEF division. The decision was taken on June 14th to withdraw all remaining British troops, an evacuation called Operation Ariel. By 25th of June, almost 192,000 Allied personnel, 144,000 of them British, had been evacuated through various French ports after Dunkirk. Although the French army fought on, the German troops entered Paris on June 14th. The French government was forced to negotiate an armistice at Cologne on June 22nd. So you can see, uh, really, the fall of France was inevitable after Dunkirk because the Allied were actually extracted and and, uh, and getting out of the region. So uh, really the valiant work that was done by the French afterwards and even some of the expeditionary forces by the British, the uh, the men fought hard but uh, were outnumbered and, and outflanked. And the Germans eventually took all of France very soon after that. So that's a little bit about the Battle of Dunkirk, the evacuation of Dunkirk, or what they call the miracle of Dunkirk. Again, if you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend it. It's really an excellent one. It came out in 2017. Uh, the visuals in that movie of some of the battle scenes are really jaw-dropping. And some of the scenes of the, of the men being extracted by the small boats from all over England 
it's really inspiring to watch uh, how this operation occurred. So let's go ahead and take a uh, look at a series of short videos. And we'll come back and talk about it on the other side. Dunkirk, just a small port city on the northern French coast. But this unassuming place would become synonymous with one of the greatest rescue operations of World War II. In this video, we look at the evacuation of Dunkirk, and towards the end, we see the numbers and scale involved in the operation. To give some context to the evacuation, on May 10th, 1940, the German attack on the Netherlands began with the capture of key bridges deep within the country. The Dutch defenders fell back, and by May 12th, German tanks were on the outskirts of Rotterdam. By May 13th, the Dutch army surrendered to the Germans. The invasion of Belgium also began on May 10th, with German Fallschirmjäger troops landing on the fortress of Ebb Emel and bridges over the Albert Canal. On May 11th, the Belgian front was broken, with German tanks pushing westward, while Belgian, French and British forces fell back to a line near Antwerp. The German invasion of France rested on the surprise advance through the hilly and dense Ardennes forest. On May 10th, German tanks crossed Luxembourg to the southeastern border of Belgium, and by May 12th were crossing the French-Belgian front. The next day, they crossed the Meuse River, and on the 15th, broke through the French defences, turning westward in the direction of the English Channel. While Allied leaders were hoping for an attack to cut off the expanding bulge, German armed forces raced to the Channel and cut off the Allied forces in Belgium. Some of the obstacles that could have blocked the advance were not manned in time. German General Heinz Guderian's troops swept on and reached Abbeville, thus blocking all communication between North and South. On the 22nd of May, Guderian's troops then turned north to the coast, in a move for Calais and Dunkirk. British forces also began to turn and move towards Dunkirk, while French and Belgian troops held off the Germans. The British decided to launch Operation Dynamo, the evacuation of the British forces by sea from Dunkirk. They'd been gathering every kind of small vessel to help bring the troops back to England. The retreat to the coast now became a race to the boats before the German pincers closed. Admiral Bertram Ramsey had overall command of the operation, and tasked Captain William Tennant with tactical oversight of the evacuation. Tennant, the designated beachmaster, arrived at Dunkirk on May 27th. He discovered that the Luftwaffe had knocked out the port facilities, and realised that lifting troops directly from the beaches would be too time-consuming. He therefore turned his attention to the breakwaters at the harbour entrance. The western breakwater was no good, but the eastern was about 1.3 kilometres in length, with a wooden boardwalk, and was wide enough for a column of troops to traverse it four wide. Tennant directed the bulk of the evacuation efforts to the eastern breakwater. The remaining Allied forces had to be taken directly off the beaches, making the evacuation slow and difficult. Between the 26th of May and the 4th of June, the call went out to all vessels, be them navy or civilian, to make their way across the channel to Dunkirk to help ferry the stranded soldiers back. More than 930 ships would take part in multiple crossings. The evacuation could not have been achieved without the air cover provided by fighter aircraft from the English coast, and the heroic efforts of these vessels. However, it was Adolf Hitler who did most to make their escape possible. German panzers had reached the canal defence line close to Dunkirk as early as May 23rd, when the bulk of the British forces were still far from the port but these panzers were stopped by Hitler's order on May 24th. That order, which helped the British immensely, was prompted by several factors. German generals were wary of a British counter-attack, and overestimated its size and capabilities. General von Rundstedt expressed to Hitler the need to conserve the armoured divisions for the next stage of the offensive. 
Hermann Goering, the Luftwaffe commander, insisted that his air forces could prevent any escape by sea. Some of Hitler's generals also felt that his halt order was as a result of his belief that the British would be more willing to make peace if its pride was not wounded by seeing its army surrender. Three days passed before the German army's commander-in-chief persuaded Hitler to withdraw his order and allow the armed forces to advance. Throughout the evacuation, the Luftwaffe had bombed the beaches and ships aiding the escape but poor weather would halt any major casualties. Yet the brilliance of the evacuation could not hide the fact that the British had suffered a terrible defeat. Most of the soldiers had been saved, but almost all of its heavy equipment, tanks, artillery and motorised transport had been left behind in France. More than 50,000 British troops were unable to escape. Of these, 11,000 were killed and the bulk of the remainder were taken as prisoners of war. During the evacuation, about 198,000 British troops made it back to England, with an estimated 140,000 French, Belgian and Dutch troops also escaping. To this point in the campaign, the Germans had taken more than 1 million prisoners in three weeks. This at a cost of just 60,000 German casualties. With the bulk of the Allied forces now gone, efforts turned towards Paris, which would ultimately fall a mere 10 days after the evacuation. Christopher Nolan's latest movie is about the famous Dunkirk evacuation. Let's have a look at what exactly happened at Dunkirk. During the Second World War, in their erratic endeavor to take over the world, the Nazis launched an attack against France in May 1940. British forces immediately came to France's rescue. While the German army Group B, having invaded Netherlands, advanced to the east of France through Belgium, the Panzer Corps of the German army Group A got into France braving the deadly impenetrable Ardennes Forest. They proceeded west, eventually turning north and heading for the English Channel. The French Prime Minister didn't expect the German tanks to enter France through the impassable Ardennes Forest. It was the biggest gamble taken by Germany in World War II. The Allies, trapped on the coast of the Franco-Belgian border, became sitting ducks, waiting to be ambushed by the Germans. The battle was all but lost for Britain. The only remaining thing to do was to get their troops out of France as soon as possible. The Allied military leaders came up with what is known as Operation Dynamo to avert the impending military disaster. They decided on evacuating the soldiers through Dunkirk, the nearest port with good facilities. Initial plans had called for the recovery of 30,000 men within two days, as it was anticipated that the German troops were capable of blocking further evacuation. However, only 7,669 men were evacuated on the first day. But by the end of the eighth day, a total of 338,226 soldiers had been rescued from the beaches and harbor of Dunkirk by a hastily assembled fleet of over 800 boats. Two French divisions had stayed behind to hold off the Germans long enough for the Allied troops to escape before succumbing to the German offenses. If the Dunkirk evacuation ended up as a failure, the Germans for sure would have won World War II. So a lot of interesting things coming out of those videos. First one being uh, this operation was a humongous risk uh, and had huge consequences for the British and really for the Allies in general. If they had lost this battle, if they would lost all of those hundreds of thousands of men, who knows what would, would have happened, but the winning of World War II would have been a lot more difficult. And the holding action against the Germans going forward would have been a lot more difficult. So um, this was really, really critical that this Operation uh, Dynamo was able to be successful and that they were able to bring these men back to England and regroup and uh, fight another day. That's really essentially what was the most important. You saw in terms of the evacuation itself, most of the men were on the beaches. Um, the Brits realized immediately, and this was Ramsey and his men who were planning this evacuation, realized right away that uh, most of their ships couldn't get in close enough to pick up the men. Uh, the smaller boats that came from England that were private citizen boats, they could, so they could actually pick people up right out of the surf. But for the most part, the large ships that were coming, that were Royal Navy ships, um, needed something to pull up to. And uh, so they found this mole that was a essentially a big natural dock that went about 1.3 kilometers out into the water and allowed ships to pull up to them and uh, have men load onto them. 
And it was uh, such a miracle that they were still there, that they had not been bombed yet by the Germans, and that they could use those to evacuate uh, hundreds of thousands of men, as you see in the picture behind me. Uh, so that's one thing I'd, I'd mention there. The other thing is, as you saw, there were some men that were definitely left behind, both on the British side and French side. 50,000 Brits were not evacuated, and about 40,000 French were not evacuated. And of course, uh, most of them ended up as prisoners of war. Uh, you saw, amazingly, the Germans had taken one million prisoners of war in the first six weeks of the war of World War II. And uh, really incredible, the amount of people they essentially took off the map and were not part of the war the rest of the way. A lot of those men ended up um, being held in captivity the entire war and didn't get out until 44 or 45. So four or five years later, they were able to get out and get their freedom again. So um, pretty incredible stuff. Uh, the amount of valor and uh, planning and all the things that it took for the Battle of Dunkirk, although it was a strategic disaster for the Allies, but for them to pull this evacuation off and to save their chances for later in the war really was pretty incredible, if you really think about it. So uh, anyway, we're going to go ahead and take a look at uh, 25 interesting facts about the Battle of Dunkirk, and we'll come back and talk about it. Number one, the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, were a mix of regulars and territorials. Most of those who were in the Army in World War II were conscripts or drafted um, soldiers for the conflict. But the British Expeditionary Force, or the BEF, in 1939 and 1940 was unusual in that it was a large voluntary army. Regular soldiers were predominantly volunteers, and some had served for many years. A large proportion of the BEF were Territorial Army, or TA units, and these were also volunteers, often referred to as Saturday night soldiers, as their role in the armed forces during peacetime was part-time and usually on weekends only. The size of the BEF in 1940 was an estimated 300,000 men, and they got pressed into duty along with the draftees and the British military. And you see some pictures of many of the BEF there in the two photos from above at Dunkirk with all of them waiting to be picked up and taken back to England after they had been pushed to the coast by the Germans. Number two, Dunkirk perimeter was massive and covered two countries. You see a picture there on the top left of what the perimeter looked like. It was the 25 miles that went across northern France all the way into Belgium that surrounded Dunkirk and gave the Allies uh, some space to be able to operate and to be able to get most of their men off of the beaches. As the Allies pulled back across northern France, a decision was made to defend Dunkirk area to allow men to be evacuated. The defensive perimeter set up largely along the lines of canals and waterways, which offered a natural barrier extended more than 10 miles inland from the beaches and across 25 miles from Dunkirk town to Newport in Belgium. The thousands of men defending these were therefore spread across both French and Belgian soil in an area as big as the Ypres salient battlefields of World War I. This was a huge area that they were defending against the Germans. You can see that encircling uh, area there that is the essentially the external perimeter they were building. Uh, Hitler, if he had not done his three-day halt order, might have crushed this from the very beginning and not allowed any kind of perimeter to come together. But because he did allow a three-day halt, the uh, Allies were able to put this together. Number three, it was not all about the beaches. Of the 338,000 Allied soldiers evacuated at Dunkirk, only a third of them were taken off the famous Dunkirk beaches. While the popular myth remembers the beaches, most men were evacuated via the less glamorous mole. And we mentioned this mole earlier. This was a natural rock formation with a bridge on top of it. It was essentially a stone jetty that extended along the harbor mouth. The far end was wooden. The water either side of the mole was so deep that it was meant for large vessels that could come in and moor up and load very quickly. Ships were sunk here by bombs from German dive bombers, but it was still a very effective method of getting in the majority of the troops and getting them away to England. The mole survived World War II, but was lost in a storm in the 1970s, although the stone sections still remain. And you see a picture in the middle there of what the mole looked like as the men were loading up on ships 
during this evacuation. On the bottom right is what the mole looks like today. It was mostly destroyed, but there's still some rocks that are still there. You can see some of the numbers there at Dunkirk. 98,780 men were lifted from the beaches, whereas 239,000 plus from the harbor and the mole. So a little bit more than two thirds of the men actually went over this uh, mole bridge to their boats. Number four, not all the little ships were little. More than 700 private vessels were requisitioned as part of Operation Dynamo to save the British troops at Dunkirk. Many people believe that they were all small boats, but the fleet of so-called little ships included some quite large vessels. For example, the Isle of Man Stream Packet Company provided 10 of its 16 ships, which included substantial steam-powered ones like the Mona's Queen, which weighed in at over 2,700 tons. And you can see a picture up there on the top right of the Mona's Queen and what it looked like. So company ships alone were rescued more than 26,000 men from Dunkirk, giving an insight into the importance of their role. Many little ships were lost, and the wrecks of some can still be seen on the Dunkirk beaches even to this day. So out of the almost 800 vessels that they had, many of them actually were hit by German airplanes that were coming in as dive bombers. You see another uh, kind of medium-sized boat that was used there in the middle there. That's the Walmer lifeboat, Charles Didbin. And then you see a picture there on the bottom right of what it might have looked like with all of the hundreds of ships all coming across at the same time across the English Channel to Dunkirk, the French port, and uh, what it must have been like with the aerial battles that were going above with the Royal Air Force against the German Luftwaffe. And you see a flag up there on the top. The, it was called the Dunkirk Jack, and it was a special flag flown only by civilian ships that participated in the Dunkirk evacuation. It essentially gave those civilian ships uh, some autonomy and some authority underneath the uh, British military. So, because essentially they were requisitioned for this purpose. Number five, lorry or truck piers were created to get men to the boats. You can see pictures there on the top left and right. They would line up all of the trucks or as the British call them, lorries, side by side by side. And then they would put wooden planks over top of them it's for the men to be able to go all the way out and get onto a boat. For the men who were evacuated off the beaches, there were problems in that very few of them could swim. How to get them through deep water and onto a ship? Well, an idea was developed to line up lorries or trucks across the beach at low tide, side by side, and put planking over top of them. This turned the line of lorries and trucks into an improvised pier at high tide, enabling those unable to swim to walk over the lorries and board ship out to sea. Many of the more than 100,000 men taken off the beaches actually used this method of going across the trucks. So pretty interesting. They came up with every type of way they could think of to get the men onto the boats and the ships. Number six, the Indian Army was at Dunkirk. Britain relied heavily on the Commonwealth in World War II, but few Commonwealth troops took part in the 1940 cam campaign. However, several Indian mule companies were in France at the time being used to resupply the British Army. These men were evacuated via Dunkirk, but en route past the old Indian Army Memorial at New Chapelle from the First World War. Four of these companies, 22, 25, 29, and 32, came directly from India as part of the Royal Indian Army Service Corps, and two from Cyprus as part of the Royal Army Service Corps. Several Indian soldiers were killed, making the sacrifice at Dunkirk truly multinational. You see a picture there on the top left of what some of these Indian companies looked like that were supporting with supplies. And on the bottom left, uh, that's them operating in the region with their gas masks because often the German planes would come in and drop different types of gas canisters. Number seven, the Royal Air Force were in the skies above the beaches. You see lots of really good shots there from that day from the Royal Air Force as they're flying over to support. Many of the soldiers at Dunkirk believed that the Royal Air Force had been pulled back to Britain to defend the mainland and that they had been abandoned to their fate at the hands of the Luftwaffe. Recent research has showed that RAF squadrons were actually very active over the Dunkirk perimeter, giving vital coverage to the men on the ground. 
There are also flying sorties inland to attack the German lines of communication and troop movements. So really the rumor by the men on the beaches that the RAF are not uh, active is actually not true. They were flying lots of sorties and doing lots of things to try to support this major evacuation. Number eight, the medics could not leave with the rest of the troops. There were many thousands of wounded at Dunkirk, some of them defending the perimeter, some wounded in the evacuation, many brought in having been wounded earlier in the Battle of France. A significant number were evacuated out via the mole where they could be more easily taken aboard ships on stretchers. However, some were so badly wounded that they could not be moved at all and had a large number of personnel from the Royal Army Medical Corps volunteered to stay behind to care for them. This meant they were subsequently taken prisoner. Most were not released until 1945, so they spent five years as a prisoner for the Germans. You can see there are a couple of really excellent pictures of the medics helping the men who were injured on the battlefield and trying to patch them up and trying to save their lives as much as they can. These guys were real heroic because they stayed behind to take care of them, and many of them got captured by the Germans. Number nine, many French stayed behind to maintain the perimeter. You see some pictures there on top left and bottom left uh, of them holding the perimeter and, and getting together and uh, trying to hold off the Germans as long as they could so the evacuation could take place. One of the wartime myths of Dunkirk in occupied France was that British soldiers refused to evacuate their French allies. This was used by Nazi-backed Vichy government to demonize Britain. The reality is that nearly 140,000 French, Belgian, and Polish troops were evacuated in Operation Dynamo as well. In addition, over 40,000 French soldiers stayed behind at Dunkirk to keep the perimeter intact to the very last moment that the final evacuation took place. Their sacrifice helped save the British Army and should never be forgotten. So really, uh, some of these myths that happened over time really have started to be debunked. And this is one of them. The French actually fought very admirably, very hard for their country and for uh, their allies, the British, to be able to get off the beach. Number 10, we are not sure how many British soldiers died at Dunkirk and how many died in the Battle of France. As the British Army retreated in May 1940, operational war diaries and many military papers were lost and destroyed. In the confusion of the retreat, many soldiers got separated from the units, and when the final reckoning of casualties was made by the war office, it stated that 2,972 officers and 66,000 men were killed, wounded, or missing from 10th of May, 1940, until the last day of evacuation, June 4th, 1940. This equated to about one in three of the BEF were injured or killed. The problem was it wasn't as known how many of these men died or how many actually died at Dunkirk. The cemeteries there have over a thousand burials from Dunkirk period. Many graves show dates of death as May 10th and others are mid-June. So probably never know what the true cost of the miracle of Dunkirk really was. So interestingly enough, uh, in the confusion of war and just the mass uh, operation they were working through, uh, we'll never fully know what these numbers are. You can see BEF left the following equipment behind in France. And you saw that in the video a picture of some of the equipment that was left, but 2,472 2, artillery guns, 63,000 plus vehicles, 20,000 motorcycles, 76,000 tons of ammunition, and 416,000 tons of stores or supplies. So really pretty amazing, not just the uh, casualties in men, but also the amount of equipment and food and, and ammunition that they had to leave. Number 11, the German attack was supposed to be impossible. France collapsed so quickly in 1940 due to the element of surprise enjoyed by its German attackers, thanks to General Erich von Manstein, who proposed an invasion route that was widely believed to be impossible. In Manstein's plan, the German column of tanks and motorized infantry would force their way through the forests of Ardennes in southeast Belgium and Luxembourg. And we mentioned this earlier that there was this perception by the Brits and French that this had been impenetrable in World War I, and so they weren't going to worry about it or fortify it because uh, the Germans couldn't get their tanks and other uh, motorized infantry through this thick, hilly woodland. It was very difficult for tanks 
But the Germans, uh, through Manstein and his colleague, German Heinz Guterin, realized that a new network of narrow paved roads had come about since World War I and would allow just enough room for tanks and trucks to squeeze through and allow them to do their blitzkrieg strategy. The Germans passed through Ardennes into f northern France in just two and a half days, cutting off hundreds of thousands of Allied troops with only one escape route, and that was the sea. So this is how they pinned the uh, Allied troops. And you can see there on the top right, the A path was where the Germans came through and completely surprised the Allied troops and flanked them and forced the Allied troops to then flee to Dunkirk for their uh, exit. You can see some really good photos there from Dunkirk and during that time of the Germans who were coming through the very heavily forested areas and through those very small roads. They found their way through that region. Number 12, one French word was burned into Winston Churchill's memory, and that was Akun. The German invasion of France began on May 10th, 1940, the same day Winston Churchill became prime minister. On May 14th, four days later, when he paid his first official visit to Britain's ally, France, Holland had capitulated and Paris was preparing for evacuation. But an even worse surprise was in store. In one of the most famous passages in military history, Churchill recounted the moment he learned that the French didn't have any troops in reserve. I asked, where is the strategic reserve? And breaking into French, who est la masse de manoeuvre? General Gamelin returned to me and with a shake of his head and shrug replied, Akun, or there is none. I was dumbfounded. What were we to think of the great French army and its highest chief? It would never occur to me that any commanders would have left themselves unprovided with a mass maneuver. This was one of the greatest surprises I've had in my life. So essentially he was told by the French commander that they didn't have any backup troops. They had no way to resupply. They had no way to reinforce and uh, they were going to have to live with what they had. You can see a picture there of Churchill with his first visit to the French delegation in Paris. Number 13, Hitler made a fatal strategic mistake on May 24, 1940, as we mentioned in the video. The Allied troops on the French and Belgian coast had been totally surrounded by powerful German tank columns, rendering them essentially defenseless against the impending German onslaught. And then came a brief reprieve as the attackers suddenly stopped for 48 hours, allowing the British to dig in and create a defensive perimeter around Dunkirk, setting the stage for evacuation. For reasons that still are not clear, and you heard some of the theories in the video about why Hitler might have done this, but Hitler, over the protests of his own generals and to the befuddlement of historians, had ordered Guderian to halt for two days to rest and resupply. It's true that the German troops were worn out after two weeks of fighting and German may have worried about a repeat of 1914 when exhausted German troops were forced to withdraw at the Marne. He also might have been swayed by Hermann Gorig, the chief of German Luftwaffe, who boasted that air power alone could destroy the helpless Allied forces at Dunkirk. And you can see uh, with his arrogance, uh, this quote that Hitler said about Dunkirk, Dunkirk has fallen with it has ended the greatest battle of world history. Soldiers, my confidence in you knows no bounds. You have not disappointed me. So you can see he really had a lot of bravado. He had a lot of arrogance uh, going into the Dunkirk battle and thought that he had the British pinned and that they weren't going to go anywhere. And so he was going to give his troops some time to rest. Well, because he did that, of course, he allowed the uh, allies to dig in and to defend their area so they could have an evacuation, be successful. Number 14, German dive bombers were equipped with sirens to spread terror. You can see a picture of one of the dive bombers there on the top left. And then on the bottom left, you see a special device with a little propeller that was put on every one of these dive bombers. Among many examples of Germany's evil genius for psychological warfare, one of the most famous was the decision to equip its Ju-87 dive bombers with air-powered sirens that emitted a shrieking unearthly wail as the plane went into attack. The siren known as Jericho Trumpet was intended to spread terror among enemy troops and civilians on the ground, and it worked. To this day, the Jericho Trumpet is one of the most recognizable and terrifying sounds of the war. 
It was certainly one of the lasting impressions of the Dunkirk evacuation for ordinary troops caught beneath the German bombs. Lieutenant Edelman, a British gunner who was waiting to be evacuated on Malo Lebanon's beach, later recalled the Stukas diving, zooming, screeching, and wheeling over our heads like a flock of huge infernal seagulls. So this, uh, you can see the Germans really had a penchant for um, misinformation, for propaganda, for psychological warfare, for finding ways to scale the hell out of their enemies. And you can see this one really worked. Number 15, the French fought valiantly to cover the evacuation. To, although Churchill and other Brits were quick to criticize the failure of France's generals during the fall of France, many ordinary French soldiers and officers fought bravely and honorably, and one hopeless last stand in particular probably helped enable the successful evacuation of Dunkirk. As British and French troops withdrew to Dunkirk 40 miles to the southeast, French troops in two corps of the French First Army staged a ferocious defense against seven German divisions from May 28th to May 31st, 1940, refusing to surrender and mounting several attempts to break out despite being heavily outnumbered 110,000 to 40,000. The valiant French effort led by General Jean-Baptiste Molinet helped tie up three German tank divisions under Erwin Rommel, enabling the British Expeditionary Force and the remaining troops of the French First Army to retreat and dig in at Dunkirk, ultimately saving another 100,000 Allied troops. You can see a picture there of Melanet, who was the uh, French general who was crafting this uh, defensive strategy, and then some of his troops there in the middle. So uh, pretty amazing, some of the valiant uh, work that was done by the French to just buy some time for the Allies so that they could get all the men off the beaches and off the docks. Number 16, Vice Admiral Ramsey led the Operation Dynamo from the cliffs of Dover. You saw in the video a reference to Ramsey as the lead of this operation. Operation Dynamo was the rescue operation implemented by the British Royal Navy. It was coordinated by Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey and his small team in Dover Castle. You see a picture there on the bottom right of Dover Castle in the Dover Cliffs area. There beneath the fortress, a network of tunnels deep within the cliffs became the nerve center controlling the evacuation of Allied forces from Dunkirk. From May 19, 1940, realizing the rescue by sea would be necessary, Ramsey and his staff at Dover were making plans and arranging for ships to evacuate the BEF. On May 26, they were ordered to put their plans into action, and they began mobilizing military and private boats alike. The tunnels below the castle, which were first dug during the Napoleonic Wars, played a vital role in the war effort after Dunkirk. From 1943, they served as a combined headquarters for all three services, Army, Navy, and Air Force. It's so really this castle and all of the uh, tunnels below were really a key part of the British strategy, both in Dunkirk in 1940, but then later in the war as kind of an operation or nerve center for the British. You can see a picture there of Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey there on the bottom left. And then in the center there was his operations room where he was getting communications in from all the areas of the battlefields in Europe. And he was able to make decisions about this uh, incredible operation they were doing, which was Operation Dynamo. Number 17, the little ships played a vital role in Dunkirk evacuation plan. You'll see a picture there of a whole string of little ships that were waiting to go. They were waiting to get the word that they were to go across and get the men at Dunkirk. The little ships played an important part in the evacuation. Ramsey and his team quickly realized that small boats would be able to get close to the beach and ferry troops out to larger ships. By May 31st, hundreds of civilian vessels from fishing smacks cockle boats to lifeboats, sailing barges, had answered the Royal Navy's call for help and crossed the English Channel to Dunkirk. Crewed mainly by volunteers and British patriots, these tiny vessels bravely and repeatedly picked up soldiers, queuing patiently on the beaches and in the water, and ferried them out to waiting larger ships. Under severe attack from German aircraft and artillery, many also took troops back across the channel themselves. So in some cases, they took um, the troops to larger ships, and in other cases, they just went straight to England and took them. Most of the private citizens saving the troops that day were compensated six months later with a one-time check from the British government. 
of 300 pounds as their appreciation. So they weren't doing this for money, obviously. They were doing it as uh, patriots to their country, but they were compensated a little bit some months later. Pretty amazing to think about this huge fleet of hundreds of little ships that helped make this evacuation possible. Number 18, Dunkirk evacuation was a miracle, but a strategic disaster for the Allies. Dunkirk and the surrender of France that followed some three weeks later left Britain isolated, vulnerable, and under imminent threat of invasion. The BEF had abandoned or destroyed nearly all of its heavy equipment at Dunkirk. Hitler declared the evacuation a decisive victory for Germany. But by rescuing the bulk of the army in what was the biggest evacuation in military history, Operation Dynamo returned to Britain a priceless asset, most of their trained and experienced troops. Britain and France and allies with the USA in consultation would live to fight another day. The evacuation was publicized as a miracle to boost public morale. The British nation galvanized under Winston Churchill to devote itself entirely to war. It did so not only effectively, but perhaps surprisingly with the total confidence in eventual victory. The Dunkirk spirit, reflecting a nation united and working against apparently impossible odds to thwart Hitler's ambitions, was born. And you see a couple of great uh, pictures there. There's an artist rendering on the top right of what the Dunkirk beaches must have looked like with the small boats coming up closer to the beach, the larger vessels having to stay a little further out because of the depth of the water, all the men waiting to be picked up in an orderly way. And this operation went on for eight days to get the 300,000 plus men back to England. Really excellent book there, I highly recommend by Walter Lord. It's called The Miracle of Dunkirk, which is the true story of Operation Dynamo. And it really goes into great detail of uh, everything that happened in those eight days. Number 19, the Germans dropped leaflets calling for surrender. You can see a copy of one of those leaflets on the top left up there. That's what it actually looked like. As dramatized in the opening sequence of Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk, you see two great photos from the excellent movie I talked about earlier. Top up there is the Dunkirk movie, Christopher Nolan, and then the bottom left, you'll see a scene that's in that movie of the men who are looking up at the German planes, waiting on the dock to be rescued by the ships that were pulling up. So as dramatized in the opening sequence of Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk, the German planes were dropping leaflets as well as bombs. These leaflets showed a map of Dunkirk as well as reading in English. British soldiers, look at the map. It provides your true situation. Your troops are entirely surrounded. Stop fighting. Put down your arms. And so we talked about how the Germans were experts at propaganda and experts at psychological warfare. Well, this was another technique they were using was to drop these leaflets on British and French soldiers and trying to get them to lay down their arms. Number 20, evacuating troops were remarkably orderly and not panicked. Many onlookers were amazed by the patience and calm nature of the troops being evacuated. The troops acted as if they had been trained and drilled for such a situation. One of the signalers being evacuated, Alfred Baldwin, recalled, you had the impression of people standing waiting for a bus. There was no pushing or shoving. And you see some excellent photos from those couple of days at Dunkirk of the men lining up, queuing up, getting ready to get on one of the ships that was coming over to save them. Number 21, a national day of prayer was declared in England. On May 26, 1940, King George VI called for a national day of prayer as the British Army was trapped at Dunkirk during World War II and the Allied retreat was underway. The day was a plea for divine intervention to save the nation's troops who faced a real threat of annihilation. In a national broadcast, the king instructed the people of UK to turn to God in repentance and ask for divine help. Millions of people across British Isles flocked to churches to pray, including a special service at Westminster Abbey in which the king himself attended. That was so crowded that a famous photograph captured a quarter mile long queue waiting to get into the church. And you see a picture there on the bottom left of that quarter mile long queue trying to get into Westminster Abbey. These prayers were evidently answered, and Walter Matthews, who was dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, was the first to pronounce the miracle of Dunkirk. You see a picture there of the form of almighty prayer, time of war, who was given by King George VI, and he's standing there with Churchill and his wife. 
Number 22, the Dunkirk evacuation inspired one of the most famous speeches by Churchill. The British press were elated with the success of the evacuation, often citing the Dunkirk spirit of the British rescuers. This spirit was embodied in Churchill's famous speech to the House of Commons on June 4th, 1940. We shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Of course, this is one of his most famous speeches during this time, and he was inspired by this incredible evacuation from Dunkirk. He actually waited to give the address until after every single man was taken off the beaches and extracted. In this speech, Churchill had to describe a great military disaster and warn of a possible invasion attempt by Nazi Germany without casting doubt on eventual victory, which was a really interesting balance. He had to give them hope. He had to really inspire them. He had to pump them up. But also he had to be realistic about the uh, defeat that they had just experienced by letting France fall. He also had to prepare his domestic audience for France's falling out of the war without in any way releasing France to do so and and wish to reiterate a policy and an aim unchanged despite intervening events from his speech May 13th, 1940, in which he had declared the goal of victory, however long and hard the road may be. So he had a really delicate balance here of trying to keep everybody engaged, keep everyone in the war effort, looking forward, staying focused, but also acknowledging some of the setbacks that they had had. Number 23, the extent of the miracle that was Dunkirk evacuation cannot be overstated. Famous statement by General Alan Brooke went down in the pages of history as the most correct description of the situation faced by the British at the time. He said, nothing but a miracle can save the BEF now. Initial estimation stated the evacuation of only 45,000 stranded troops was possible within a time frame of 48 hours. Instead, the operation turned out to be the largest and most successful evacuation operation in military world history. The first stage of the operation was to make sure enough vessels were available for the evacuation. Royal Navy needed every vessel possible, big or small, to evacuate as many soldiers as possible in as less time as practically possible. The response of the British public to the call was unexpectedly huge, and a large number of vessels was sent to the Royal Navy at the time. People gave up their paddle streamers, their lifeboats, their motor launches, their private yachts for the operation. Now on display at the Imperial War Memorial, Tamzine was the smallest vessel used in the evacuation. It was a fishing boat of a mere 14 feet long with an open top. You can see some pictures there on the right of what some of those vessels look like coming across from England to pick up men. And then on the top right there of what it must have looked like to see 700 or 800 vessels coming across and being dive bombed by the Germans. You can see some of the vessels actually on fire or sinking. So uh, if you got across and made it through the German Luftwaffe, that was a challenge in itself. And then you had to obviously pick up the men on the beaches and then try to get home. Number 24, the numbers of men and vessels involved in Operation Dynamo was staggering. Over the first week of the evacuation, a total of 338,226 stranded troops were successfully evacuated under intense enemy bombing. Along with British soldiers, 140,000 Polish, French, and Belgian troops were also rescued. A total of 933 Royal Navy ships and civilian vessels were involved in Operation Dynamo. Around 200,000 soldiers waited patiently on the Dunkirk Mole. We showed a picture of that earlier, that natural dock a long stone wooden jetty at the edge of the port and were eventually rescued amid hail of enemy shells. The rest of the soldiers had to wait in cold shoulder deep water for up to 24 hours before naval ships evacuated them. Imagine what your body must have felt like if you had to be in the water for up to a day waiting for evacuation. You must have been so numb. A total of 700 small and mostly civilian boats were used to pick up the stranded soldiers from the shallow waters near the beach. They were then transferred to bigger vessels waiting in the deep waters. Small boats had to then make multiple trips to fetch more troops from the beach. So it wasn't just one trip that these small boats were making, but they were making multiple trips. You can see some really excellent pictures and uh, snapshots coming out of the excellent Dunkirk movie that I mentioned earlier. You can see what that mole must have looked like with thousands of men just waiting to be picked up. 
Number 25, some excellent books, movies, and shows have been done on the battle and evacuation of Dunkirk. We mentioned the Dunkirk movie there on the top left, and just below it, the making of Dunkirk, which is a really excellent one-hour behind-the-scenes look at what it was like to make this excellent movie. You'll see a lot of really great books on this list. Dunkirk Retreat to Victory, After Dunkirk, Dunkirk Fight to the Last Man, Dunkirk A Miracle of Deliverance, Dunkirk to D-Day. That's a really excellent book. I, I thumbed through that one as well. Uh, and then, interestingly enough, there's a TV show you see there on the BBC on the bottom right called Dunkirk that was really, really well made too. A lot of great scenes in that TV show. So I highly recommend you pick uh, one of these great books or TV shows or movies to, to look at and to learn more about Dunkirk and everything that happened during this Battle of France and then the evacuation. Hopefully you enjoyed that and you learned a lot about the Battle of Dunkirk, about the incredible miracle of Dunkirk and the evacuation that happened. Uh, who knows what would have happened in World War II if this evacuation had not occurred and we had not saved our allies and all of the troops and the men who would later on go to victory. Uh, much later in the war. So uh, really uh, pretty astounding what occurred those couple of days with the British and French troops holding the perimeter, trying to build some time and some space for these ships and boats to come in. All the civilian boat captains who came in who were volunteers uh, coming in to try to save their countrymen. Uh, so really incredible. I do uh, recommend you dig into this event a little bit more uh, at the beginning of World War II. And as I said before, also check out our episode on D-Day, which happened, of course, uh, four years later. Also a lot of fascinating research put into that one. Uh, we're going to close with um, the famous speech we talked about from Churchill that he gave on June 4th, right after the last man was taken off the beaches at Dunkirk. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air, we shall defend our island, whatever the cross may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. So as you can see there, uh, pretty inspiring and amazing words. Uh, I can't imagine what the impact must have been on the British people listening to that uh, primarily over radio um, and uh, sitting around with their families worried, you know, uh, not knowing exactly what was going to happen to their country, understanding that the uh, German and Nazi threat had gotten larger and that uh, now they're hearing the word from reporters that uh, France had been lost, that Europe had been lost, um, and now we're worrying about hundreds of thousands of their countrymen that are pinned on the beaches over in France and hoping that they could get home. And so, to hear uh, those inspiring words from Churchill must have been very comforting and given them a lot of confidence that they were still going to win. They still were going to be victorious. Anyway, thank you so much for attending our program today and taking a look at Dunkirk, a really fascinating event in our history, especially in World War II. As World War II kicked off, this really uh, set the tone for what the Allies realized was going to be a long conflict and a very heavy toll and casualty uh, war that was going to happen. Uh, this was the second war Germany had uh, hoist upon Europe in just 30 years. And so um, really uh, the Allies were under no illusion that this was not going to be tough and that this was going to be a very difficult road ahead. But uh, I hope you uh, dig into this topic a little bit more. Thank you so much and hope you love history as much as we do. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel. We have a lot of great programs coming your way. Hope you have a great evening. Dear, I'm writing you from somewhere in France, hoping this finds you well. Sergeant says I'm doing fine, a soldier and a half. Here's a song that we'll all sing, it'll make you laugh, my girl, the